This is Questions of Courage, a podcast from the youth section at the Goetheanum, hosted by Nathaniel Williams. Welcome to Questions of Courage. Today I'd like to speak about peace, and I'd like to do it by reflecting on a forum that I just participated in at the World Goethe Annum Conference, which took place um, recently. And I was on a forum for three days um, with Friedrich Glasel, the well-known scholar and um, also consultant and peace worker. Mirka Herter, who's also been active in uh, peace organizations and peace work in Europe. Leah Ivanova and Martin Schwartz of the Future Shapers. And then there were another uh, 60, 70 people who participated in, in these three forums from all over the world, including, including places where there's current hot conflict, where there's open war, um, people from Ukraine and from Russia in the forum. And there was a lot, of course, that, that t- came to light and was discussed in this forum, but I would like to try to talk a little bit about the power and the importance of music and creativity and art in peace work, however, by connecting it to some of the things that came up in the forum. And first of all, I'd like to to start by just talking about a couple elements from presentations that Friedrich Glasel made to the whole group. He was um, sharing with us some work that he's recently done, which um, on the logic of war or conflict and peace, the logic of peace, and particularly from the perspective of macro level conflict. So really such as warfare or um, situations of active occupation and oppression. And this is about to appear in a journal this article that he has been working on, but he shared in a presentation form some of what is in this article. And I'm only going to bring up now just one point, um, which was um, the tendency to think about um, uh, boycotts and also um, economic restrictions to try to control and to try to change the action of someone that you're in conflict with on a macro level. And Friedrich Glazel describes this as a part of the logic of war and the logic of conflict. And that in the logic of peace, very important, instead of um, going directly to that level of response, to try to seek out communication and windows of opportunity to insist that um, the person or the group or the government that you're in conflict with understands that you do not want to break off fruitful economic cooperation um, and that you want to establish conversations for peace immediately without any such recourse. You can imagine that many people in the room at that point um, were thinking about the history of their own societies in their own countries. And indeed, there was someone there from South Africa who was reflecting on the end of apartheid and how boycotts had played such an important role in um, the transition of power in the end of apartheid. I had to think something similarly when I was sitting and listening to this this, uh, presentation because obviously in the history of uh, the United States where I'm from, um, nonviolent resistance, organization, targeted boycotts, targeted nonviolent protest and resistance was a huge part of the transformation from a segregated society to a less segregated society during the civil rights movement. And at the same time, I had to think about this. I had to think about what I knew of the work of some of the most well-known nonviolent activists and leaders in my history, particularly Martin Luther King Jr. I had to think about Martin Luther King Jr. and the success that boycotts and nonviolent resistance brought 
towards or in the civil rights movement. And um, before I turn to Martin Luther King Jr. himself, I'd like to read a, um, a small passage from a book that was written by William F. Pepper called An Act of State, The Execution of Martin Luther King Jr. Pepper was involved in the civil rights movement, was close um, collaborator with Martin Luther King Jr. And at the end of his life, they were even discussing the possibility of sharing a ticket um, uh, for the presidency of the United States before Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered. And in 2003, William Pepper is looking back on the history or the inheritance of the civil rights movement and how in many cases successes are being turned around, successes are being turned on their heads. And he writes, I'm afraid that the obstacles appear to be insurmountable unless the unthinkable occurs. Should an economic disaster similar to that of 1929 engulf this nation and the world, there may emerge an opportunity to rebuild this great republic with a vastly different set of values and priorities put in place instead of those of the old order, which would be swept away not by a revolution, but by a transformation. We have learned by now that a political revolution is not enough. It must be part of a broader social, economic, and cultural revolution, which goes to the very essence of the type of human being developed and the quality of life which is being affirmed. William Pepper is writing this in 2003, and this points to something, however, that we find already clearly described and clearly characterized in the work of Martin Luther King Jr. already three decades before, which of course Pepper was familiar with. And this was a, an awareness that with all of the legislative and all of the political successes that could be achieved through nonviolent sit-ins, through boycotts, through um, a kind of economic or even social coercive nonviolent technique. These were not sustainable. These were not necessarily instruments of peace. Alone, they would not endure. And this is a important um, dimension of the civil rights movement. And I'd like to read to you um, a couple um, passages from the book, Where Do We Go From Here? from Martin Luther King Jr. And to turn our attention towards a more comprehensive imagination of peace that certainly was alive in him and so many other people, and of course is to this day. He writes, I am convinced that we shall not have the will, the courage, and the insight to deal with such matters unless in this field we are prepared to undergo a mental and spiritual reevaluation, a change of focus which will enable us to see that the things that seem most real and powerful are indeed now unreal and have come under the sentence of death. And here he's talking about a real spiritual cultural transformation that is foundationally or fundamentally connected to true progress in politics, to true, pro true project, progress, in this case, in the civil rights movement. He goes on just a couple sentences later to put this in a picture form. It is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. We must concentrate not merely on the eradication of war, but on the affirmation of peace. A fascinating story about Ulysses and the sirens is preserved for us in Greek literature. The sirens had the ability to sing so sweetly that sailors could not resist steering toward their island. Many ships were lured upon the rocks, and men forgot home 
duty and honor as they flung themselves into the sea to be embraced by arms that drew them down to death. Ulysses, determined not to succumb to the sirens, first decided to tie himself tightly to the mast of his boat and his crew stuffed their ears with wax. But finally, he and his crew learned a better way to save themselves. They took on board the beautiful singer Orpheus, whose melodies were sweeter than the music of the sirens. When Orpheus sang, who would bother to listen to the sirens? In this picture, the challenge of sustainable peace, the challenge, the true challenge of peace, really just shines out. It is the challenge that there be a spirit of peace so powerful that it makes the forces that are pulling all of us in different ways towards destruction and death less powerful. Resistance is in itself not enough. There has to be an affirmation that's so strong that it's irradiated by a true spirit of peace. This spirit of peace has to be strong enough that we can write constitutions that are constitutions of peace. It has to be strong enough that we can imagine and develop practices in economics where we can have an economy inspired by a spirit of peace. Of course, the cessation of hostilities, the outer cessation of violence, is not peace in this sense. We may have peace in our country for very different reasons. For instance, reasons of fear or simply torpor. It's remarkable, though, in the case of Martin Luther King Jr. and the story of the civil rights movement in the United States that uh, this story of Orpheus is utterly concrete in its significance because of the role that music itself played in the civil rights movement. And the fact is, is that when we look back to the boycotts and we look back to the nonviolent sit-ins and the protests and the marches, it's not only an outer act of resistance which is taking place, but inwardly there is an active, mature, conscious, creative orientation towards a spirit of peace with a longing that it can lead to a transformation of the social situation, which is tied up in so much destruction, hate, and conflict. I grew up in Winchester, Tennessee, and the story goes that about 15 miles from where I was a boy, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. first heard what was to become the hymn of the civil rights movement from Pete Seeger, we shall overcome. Now the words were somewhat different when he first heard it. But this story, uh, or this song rather, when we just listen to it, um, we can easily be led to a false impression. We can get the impression that singing this song is sentimental and that singing this song is part of a happy, clappy, rather superficial spiritual orientation. Uh, we would be severely misled, however, in thinking this. Because in the training, uh, civil rights training for nonviolent action, um, was at the same time a training for action. And at least in this particular stream of civil rights work in the 60s, there was an encouragement to look towards the people who would be attacking one physically, let's say if one was involved in a sit-in, not as a white person, not as a person of arrogance and anger, but as a child of God, 
This is a phrase which obviously grew directly out of the Judeo-Christian tradition of the southern churches in the United States. But a child of God is not determined by their race or their color, not determined by even their religion or cultural tradition, history, sex. No, it actually encouraged civil rights workers to look beyond all of those general categories to a part of the human being which cannot be grasped by any general category or generalization, and that that part at the same time is a point of possible transformation, growth, ennoblement. And it was this view that allowed people to go into situations and to be attacked physically, to be attacked with violence, punched and kicked, and to not respond violently. And not only that, but inwardly to be developing an imagination, to be developing a picture of a part of the other human being that was attacking them, which could overcome the illness of racism. Racism was seen as a kind of sickness. And the work of the civil rights movement was also a kind of therapeutic intervention in society for one's brothers and sisters. And while one is thinking this, while one is trying to connect to this imagination of the spiritual human being, one is then singing, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. But one is also actually cultivating new verses and new imaginations to capture the specificity of this situation. One is going into a moment, an act of civil disobedience. One is being attacked physically and one is singing, we are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. And this music, the power of this music and the presence of this music, it is easy to underestimate the role that it played and the role that it still plays to this day for many people. Because this artistic, this musical orientation opens up a kind of portal for spiritual presences, also peaceful presences in this particular case, which have immense transformative power. I would like to point out, of course, that it is not only um, the, the, the artistic orientation and pictorial orientation or musical orientation is not necessarily moral in the good sense. We also know that it can be used for propaganda, for commercial purposes and political purposes of manipulation. But that does not mean that it is not an important part of peace work. And we see this artistic or musical orientation playing such a powerful role in the United States with so many people who had been denied the education of literacy, of writing, of reading for generations. We know that as classically depicted in the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, um, much of the singing that took place in congregations took place through call and response, simply because that was the way also to share the words when it wasn't possible to read them out of a hymnal. And perhaps in some strange paradoxical way, this sensitivity for the spoken word, for music, um, played a part in a receptivity to a non-intellectual 
and an imaginative receptivity for forces of the good, spiritual forces of the good, spiritual forces of peace that we see clearly at work in the civil rights movement in the United States of America. Now, I've only spoke about one episode in um, peace work from my own country, looking at the fact that Martin Luther King Jr., he knew in his work that nonviolent resistance, boycotts, forms of social coercion were necessary in order to help um, immediately um, in the segregated society and racist society of the United States. At the same time, he was aware that the fruits that they could deliver were actually ephemeral, that there was much, much deeper piecework that was necessary. Piecework connected to constitutional design, but also to questions of social economy and even materialistic culture. In the history of North America, if we go further back 800 years, we find a similar story of the power of music and the transformation of Tadadaho by the peacemaker and the forming of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Jigunza Zay, who was one amongst the traveling group of diplomats, so to say, with the peacemaker, um, was revealed a song which led to a power of transformation that could lead to the constitution of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And this confederacy was so connected to the spirit of progressive peace that the great initiator of it is only referred to as the peacemaker and not by his spoken name, which is considered holy. But we also see such amazing situations as we can learn about in Estonia at the end of the Soviet Confederacy or the USSR, where music and national folk music in particular, was able to be a conduit for um, spirits of peace to resist um, a kind of communist totalitarianism. So I hope that in these stories and descriptions, and particularly in talking about specific case, something of the complexity of the use of economic coercion through boycotts or social coercion through sit-ins is inter can be intertwined with a consciousness of deeper spiritual questions about peace and what it means to actually imagine a society that is at peace. If we do not have open violence in our streets, it does not mean that we live in a society of peace. And if we achieve political change through boycotts and through nonviolent resistance, we also still may be very far from peace. And in any case, when we re realize this, one of the greatest challenges that we will find is how to put pictorial, artistic orientations, music, and all of the creative palette of human culture at the service of peace. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey. And uh, this is a project which is supported by the Goethe Amman Communications team and Goethe Amman TV and the weekly. And we are also doing it, and the production costs are quite small for it, in order to encourage uh, contributions for a Youth Access and Project Fund, which can support uh, work with young people um, in the youth section at the Goethe Anum, but also youth projects in our global network or access in our global network. 
So I do encourage you to consider making a gift, which you can learn more about at, in the link under this video. Thank you so much.